Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kiralee Thompson. I'm from Australia. I work for Central Queensland University, but in the Appleton Institute, which is based in South Australia, which was not founded by convicts. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to get that straight. Uh, today, <laughs> today, I'm going to talk to you about um, some survey data that I analysed. The Australian Horse Welfare and Wellbeing Survey um, put out, uh, sorry, the Australian Horse Industry Council put out a survey in 2011 and 2012 um, asking people about a whole range of their horse keeping practices. Uh, it was a convenient sample, 505 participants, which is pretty good for a, for a horse survey in Australia that was just delivered um, online through some uh, kind of a form of online snowball sampling through Facebook mostly. There were 38 questions, five of those were open-ended and two of those open-ended questions asked people about how they subjectively evaluate whether their horse is happy and healthy, uh, and in particular if it has its social and, social and behavioural needs met. And we analysed all of this with descriptive stats and thematic analysis. There's already a couple of papers out on the, um, on the closed-ended responses, and this is the first time I've presented um, the open-ended responses based on the welfare questions. The survey was by no means perfect. Um, the Australian Horse Industry Council designed it themselves and sent it out, and then I, I had a consultancy job to analyse the data. So there, there are a whole lot of issues around how questions were asked, and you can see this is a, a double-barrelled question. So there's massive limitations to what I'm presenting today, but if you give me a data set, I'll mine that, and I will get out what I can. And it will be a good starting point for further research. So watch this space. Uh, we asked people, uh, do you think your horse has his, that was not my phrase, social and behavioural needs met? And surprise, surprise, 56 people agree, th strongly agree. 56% strongly agree, 36% agree. Um, I mean, this, is, this doesn't tell us much, but horse people think they're doing good things. We also asked people um, how they know that their horse has its social and behavioural needs met. And if you look through um, the categories of responses, we did some, some coding to get down to these categories. You can see the five freedoms are pretty roughly mentioned there. Again, there's not many surprises. But there were three particular things uh, that we pulled out from looking through the open text responses. So the first theme um, is around competition and outings. So a lot of people said, I know my horse is happy, I know it has its social and behavioural needs met because I take it to competitions. <laughs> because based on, on the idea that humans also, also like to go out and about and meet new people, so too should a horse. Um, and, and that's not necessarily a problem. I really want to say that I don't, I'm not, I don't point my finger at people for anthropomorphising because sometimes that can lead to really good welfare outcomes. It's good that people are thinking horses have social needs at all. So, but now we need to think about how might we suggest to people that perhaps competitions and outings aren't the only way for a horse to have its social needs met? It might like to live in a paddock with a companion, for example, because there's stress involved with going out and about and there's some biosecurity risks. Um, actually, I had four themes. <laughs> the second one is around training and work. So people thought their horse was happy because it gets a lot of training and it gets a lot of work. But everyone in this room knows that there are a lot of issues around training. There's, there's scandals around tightness of nose bands. There's young horses being worked very early. So again, we might need to talk to people about what is it that makes them think that training and work is good for a horse? What is the essence of that? Is it about exercise? The, the third theme that's worth discussing is the idea of horses having company. People said, I oh, know my horse is happy because I spend a lot of time with him or her. So again, great, you're thinking that your horse has social needs for company, but let's think about conspecific needs. It might, and, and it might have a sheep as a friend, or a cow as a friend. That's great, would be, oh my God, one minute. Um, horses in nature. <laughs> People said, my horse is happy because it's doing what horses do in nature. Um, that's great, that's where we get our ethological understandings. But are we dealing with wild horses? Do our domestic horses have exactly the same needs of nature? Which has become a fairly romanticised, um, mythical kind of topic. So, based on these findings, um, <coughs> if I had better computer skills, I would have made a heat map. And these wouldn't be rigid boxes. But basically, the idea I'm playing with, and which I've come here to present so I can refine it for the purposes of publication, so there's probably holes in this, 
big caveat, um, it would appear that the more people see a horse as having similar social needs to a human, the more likely the welfare, in, the welfare outcomes will be positive for the horse. So people are thinking, yes, the horse needs company like I do. If people perceive high physiological similarity to themselves, we would hypothesise that there is a likelihood of lower welfare outcomes. For example, um, I feel cold, I need to put a jacket on, so too does my horse. I like to sleep in individuated spaces with nice bedding around me, so too must my horse, rather than with cost specifics. So this is a working model. Um, anyone who likes to criticise psychology, and I'm a cultural anthropologist, so I can, will say your boxology never fits anything, so I agree, but I'm hoping this is a way for us to talk about the fact that anthropomorphism can have positive as well as negative welfare outcomes. Thank you. <laughs>